Dr. Donovan, you mentioned your love for wisdom literature. You've written on Job. I know right now you're co-authoring a commentary on Ecclesiastes. And yet the Rice Lecture Series was on a topic which is outside of wisdom literature, the topic of holy war. Why your interest in holy war? Could you just quickly explain uh, really what that topic communicates and maybe give a, a, a brief summary of the, the three lectures that you gave today by way of the Rice Lecture Series? Okay, yeah, great. Um, well, my interest has always been in wisdom literature. I've spent a lot of time studying Job, Ecclesiastes, and so uh, I naturally tend to gravitate toward that particular portion of the Old Testament canon just because I, I enjoy wrestling with deep questions, uh, questions of theodicy, questions of the sovereignty of God, questions of how to apply God's revelation in everyday circumstances, uh, particularly in the books of Ecclesiastes and Job. We see what uh, many would call the negative sides of wisdom, that is to say when difficulties come, when tragedies strike, when calamity makes you wonder uh, what is God working to accomplish in His providence, then we wrestle with certain questions that come to the fore in Job and Ecclesiastes. How do we reconcile suffering and the reality of a fallen world with the sovereignty and goodness of God? So uh, questions such as those naturally lead toward other questions regarding how do you relate God's sovereignty, God's character to uh, the situation of a fallen world in which sin is rife, in which uh, there is violence, there is human depravity, uh, there are all sorts of uh, sins and evil that many of us, any of us could really testify to, attest to in the world. And so uh, my own interest in Holy War began as I was systematically working through the book of Joshua doing some exegesis on the conquest narratives and really began to realize that this is a pressing question that has become uh, more and more pressing in some ways over the years. Uh, if you look at the books that have been published over the last several years, uh, there is a lot of discussion and chatter about uh, the texts of the Old Testament, particularly as they relate to charges of genocide on the one hand. Uh, there, a book just came out last year, Did God Really Command Genocide? This is a common point of discussion in the uh, New Atheist movement. And so uh, those sorts of questions were pressing. And then uh, as we've seen the rise of Islamic Jihad and how that potentially relates to holy war in the Old Testament, it's an area that really interests me from an apologetic standpoint, from an exegetical standpoint, from a theological standpoint. And so for all those reasons, uh, it, it's been an issue that I've wanted to wrestle with myself and gain a firmer understanding as to what the text of Scripture is teaching us so that we can apply that to these areas of life. Uh, so as we looked at Holy War today, uh, I was exploring the past, present, and future implications of Holy War. So what I mean by that is, uh, what are the past implications in the sense of how did Holy War actually get enacted in the Old Testament? What were some of its key features? Uh, why was it conducted in the way that it was? And so just doing what was essentially a biblical theology of Holy War in the Old Testament, beginning with, uh, I suggested that it begins with the Exodus event, and it works through the history of Israel up until the time of the exile, and that it serves a pattern of God freeing His people from peril or bondage, and acting as divine warrior on their behalf. So I, I trace that through uh, the historical accounts of the Old Testament to look at the past implications. And uh, the, the chief traits of my argument were that we have to tie holy war to the nation of Israel and to the land that God had promised to the people of Israel. And I think where a lot of discussions of holy war today, in my opinion, uh, fall short is a failure to see that holy war must be, from a canonical theological perspective, tied to the nation of Israel and tied to uh, God's promises regarding the land. If we divorce holy war from the land, if we divorce it from the nation of Israel, uh, then we've really lost what I think is the essential component of holy war, that is the Lord fighting on behalf of His people to save them and uh, particularly through the nation of Israel. So we looked at that and then present implications. I wanted to explore uh, whether or not charges of genocide in the Old Testament, particularly in the conquest of Canaan, were legitimate or not. And so we explored that. Uh, we looked at modern definitions of genocide. We looked at particularly the biblical practice of harem, which is simply a Hebrew word, uh, which means to devote something to destruction. And so we looked at how that was practiced in the ancient Near East. And I made the case that uh, rather than genocide, it really was uh, God's act of asserting 
sovereignty over the land and of purifying it for the people of Israel by eradicating the pollution caused by idolatry and purifying the habitations for God's people to take possession of the land. So again, this is intricately tied to land possession, land inheritance, and the nation of Israel as they come into Canaan. And you see that in how the word is traced through the Old Testament, and in particular it revolves uh, in high occurrence around the book of Joshua where it occurs 50, 51 times. And then we looked uh, briefly at future implications, and uh, I suggested that um, tying holy war to Israel into the land helps us as a grid for interpreting eschatological texts, where again we see warfare images, and where we see, particularly in Revelation, Christ returning to enact and wage war against the adversaries of God's people. And so I suggested that uh, understanding holy war in the Old Testament tied to Israel and tied to the land helps us to see when we come to the New Testament, that's exactly what's happening again. That is that uh, from a, a dispensational theological perspective that uh, God intervenes to save national Israel in the eschaton and preparing the land for the kingdom. And so essentially I'm arguing that a dispensational interpreter who does a biblical theology of holy war, tying it to the nation of Israel and tying it to the land, really is poised, I think, best to correlate these difficult passages by seeing how holy war is really integral to the nation of Israel and to the land. And so uh, I tried to draw those connections. Of course, it's, it's a complex topic and there are a lot of facets to it, uh, but it was really an opportunity to trace that through the Old Testament and see how the Lord was working in Israel to save his people and preserving that nation so that he could bless all nations as he had promised to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, to bless every family of the earth. And so that was necessary uh, to protect God's sovereignty and justice and to extend his blessing to all the peoples of the earth. Uh, he used this measure to save and liberate his people from bondage and oppression.